Hey, you're on the Bible Forum. It is Sunday night, April 22nd, 2015. We're looking at evolution. We're looking at God. We're looking at the Bible. We're looking at what's being said today and how our world is being formed. This is part two of what ends up tonight as a three-parter. Uh, you'll need to go back and, and listen or watch the first one to get a running start for this. But for more than a thousand years, the evolutionary model has been suggested, it has been taught, it has been debated, refined by some of the best minds this world has ever seen. And to date, it is still a theory. It is a theory because no actual evidence exists to prove it. And it's partly because there was nobody there. The enemy of evolutionary theory is still here, however, and viable. It's called the Bible. And the Bible is evolution's public enemy number one. According to the American Bible Society, there are now about 900 different Bible versions. Why do we need 900? Well, we're making them better. No, we're not. We're changing them. We're making them less clear, less reliable. You know that. In recent years, there seems to have been a significant rise in the popularity and application of the theory of evolution. It now permeates just about every aspect of our life. But what does it really teach? Well, it teaches that human beings are basically good. That without external influences and or disease, human beings would be good, productive, and strong as a species. What does the history of mankind teach? That human beings are selfish, they're prideful, they're morally weak, and that without enforceable controls, they'll run amok. Now, which storyline, book, whatever, seems to fit reality better? The evolutionary model or the biblical model? Without significant guidance, structure, human beings will grow to be dependent, not independent. Where human beings are left to themselves, it very often lends itself to selfishness and to greed. Where wealth and power are available, human beings are often more selfish and more greedy. Where these patterns do not exist, there is often the influence of the God most folks say does not exist. The example is, if I'm hungry, why not steal? It seems Satan's religion revolves around a Darwinian anthropology, the study of human beings. Satan's religion is all about self. It's about pride. It's about dominance. And in human history, non-biblical religion is the preferred way to dominate other people. It is interesting to note that the ancient known religions are reminiscent of Babel, Nimrod's so-called tower. The patterns are very clear. The doctrines and the practices are similar. The emphasis on gods and goddesses are similar, even to their names. The sacrifices feature blood, very often human blood. In some cases, South American tribes, the blood was of young adult males which is an entirely interesting choice. In the case of the Philistines, the record in the Bible's book of Judges makes it clear. In Judges chapter 10, we read, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baalim. This is Baal times 10. I am is the plural ending in Hebrew. It means two or more. A lot of different Baals. And Ashtaroth. 
and the gods of Syria, and the gods of Zidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord and served him not. What were they doing? Well, we're told that they were offering, the pagans were offering their children to Moloch and to Baal. They would take newborn children and they would place them on these idols. In one illustration, I don't know if it's accurate or not, maybe it's somebody's imagination, but it seems real. Here was a, a statue with outstretched arms and the baby is placed on the outstretched arms. And then by a mechanism, the arms are raised up and the child falls into the belly of that beast, which is a fire. And the parents get to stand there and listen to their children scream until they die. That's what they were doing in the land of Canaan as they were worshiping these pagan gods. And God told the children of Israel very often to destroy the Canaanites. We now sacrifice our children to the gods of greed and comfort and wealth and selfishness of every sort. We just call it abortion on demand. But what is shocking to so many people today is that they are learning that these children could feel pain at just a few weeks of gestation. And there are some mothers out there that are having a real hard time. Canaan was a general term for the various people groups in the land surrounding Jerusalem. Uh, Canaan, as a person, as a descendant, one of Noah's uh, grandsons his, through his son Ham Canaan whom Noah cursed because of his and his tribe's immorality Canaan the people groups that God told Joseph, Joseph, Josiah, jo Joshua to completely utterly destroy Canaan the people groups David set out to destroy Canaan, the people groups who have yet to be destroyed, they still exist in a political and religious sense. They are represented by the various Islamic groups in the region. Islam captivating the descendants of Esau, Ishmael, and the various Canaanite peoples. These people glommed on to Islam out of desperation and not a little bit of fear. The fear of being beheaded if you didn't bow to Allah. The desperation to get rid of the Jews and then later the Christians. Anybody who is a person of the book. Now keep in mind, this did not happen until 600 years after Christ. That's when Muhammad was doing his thing and Islam was being born. Almost 2,000 years after Jerusalem was dedicated to Jehovah. Israel, which represents all things productive, protective, and prosperous. Canaanite as a term which represents violence, immorality, and all things contrary to anything divine. Your God or mine. The history of mankind, aside from those who follow Jehovah, is dark. It's destructive. One quick look at the world is enough to illustrate the point. The West is defined not only by geography, but by wealth, power, and religious orientation. The East is defined by the lack or the deliberate opposite of all these things. Eastern countries which are prospering, have largely embraced Western philosophy and economics, not to mention oil. 
In the end, the Bible tells us it is a Western leader who rides to the aid of Israel and by extension the world. Who will he be fighting against? He will be fighting against the enemies of God. They are described in terms of the East, Magog, Persia, Egypt, and a 200 million man army from the East. Throughout human history, religion has generally been the way to dominate men's hearts. Today, it's communism. Communism has no God but self and the state. Communism and Islam. Islam, an aloof and domineering God, Allah, who cares little or nothing about his subjects. Christianity is represented by a God-man who gave his life for his friends. Islam about a fearful God who demands absolute obedience from his subjects and offers them the reward that is entirely sensual, physical, as though disembodied men, presumably in heaven, will be interested in unbridled sex throughout all of eternity. You can't see through this? Any thinking person would see this as an obvious ploy. With Christianity, the Western world moved away from blood sacrifices and became more academic. The founding fathers and the founding documents of the fledging U.S. of A. are clearly reflective of some fairly significant and complex philosophical concepts. The United States is a nation rooted in historic observation and biblical principle. How do you undermine such a structure? Well, it's quite simple. You attack the foundation. What's the foundation? It's the Word of God. Tearing away at its religious heart without appearing to do so. Like? Well, like attacking the family structure, which is the foundation of any society, established by God. Diluting, destroying its monetary system with inflation. Corrupting its political foundation with graft, immorality, deceit, and destroying its religious values. How's he doing? It's almost like the devil's working from a script. Historically, the frontal approach didn't work. The attack was against Abel, Adam's obedient son, through Cain. Attacking Abel, who sacrificed acceptably before God, using Esau to attack Israel with the Egyptian captivity and then with Moses. Using, I should say, the descendants of Esau, using the corruption in the heart of the now freed slaves with this golden calf, ideas they got from Egypt using the Canaanite nations in the land of promise through the battles and through the deceits, using David's sensual desire in order to corrupt his soul and weaken his, his resolve in, in defeating the Canaanite nations. There came a time when he wouldn't even go out to battle anymore. And using a series of kings to further corrupt that nation. Israel's almost 1,900 years in exile was God's way of getting their attention. It was his judgment upon them for their lack of faith, their rejection of God's Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, the nation of Israel proceeded into chaos, into captivity, and into dispersion because of their rejection 
of Jesus. The Jesus who paid the awful price of sin on the cross of Calvary did it in harmony with their Bible, with their prophetic word. With the church, the Holy Spirit took up residence upon the earth. Never happened before. He now resides in the hearts and the lives of those who are now born again, children of God. So how does Satan adjust to this new development? Well, he goes after the church. He could not destroy it. The first 300 years, we saw intense persecution. Persecution that served only to increase its number. So he embraced it. The Roman Emperor Constantine recognized Christianity as Rome's official religion in 333 AD. In so doing, he empowered the religious leaders of that day who went about creating their own imperial religion. Now, given their behavior and their policies, it's very hard to see them as true Christians, but they had that title. We call it Roman Catholicism as opposed to just simply universalism, which is what the word Catholic means. It's a Roman form of that universal church. Later there was a Greek and then a Russian form, but they're all the same. For the next 1,000 years, men so corrupted that church that godly men and women were being tortured and murdered for simply rejecting their doctrines and practices. So, so Satan wins. Well, the pattern is easy to see. Satan persecutes the followers of Christ. They increase. Satan corrupts the church system. It rebounds stronger. We call it the Protestant Reformation. Satan persecutes this new revival and it takes over the world. Frustrated, Satan regroups. Unable to stop it, he begins to corrupt it by means of subtle invasions, multiplying the number of variations. We call them denominations. We've stopped doing that now because there's so many varied groups that are not really denominators. Encouraging a number of counterfeits, we call them cults. That began in the 1700s, working through to the middle of the 1800s. Emboldening the spiritually weaker members through religious liberalism, which began in the 1880s in Germany, spread to Great Britain and got over here and was flourishing in the 1960s then entertaining the exuberant, we call it charismatism, from 1960 to 1980, then introducing a contemporary form of worship, CCM, from 1990 to 2010. And now, since the turn of the century, we have been politicizing the church with social activism, and this doesn't even factor in all the subgroups and the minor groups and the crazies out there. The purpose and the result is to create a new paradigm for the church, a new way of thinking about church and doing church. No longer is it about true believers worshiping God together, being strengthened in their faith, by their faith, studying the scriptures, reaching out to others with the gospel. Now it's a business. It's an entertainment form. It's a contemporary social movement. A movement that no longer relies on Bible doctrine. Not a thimble full of Bible doctrine in a bunch of them. Name one Bible doctrine you hear from any of these people. It no longer relies on Holy Spirit power. They call it that, but it's fake. In short, it no longer relies on God's word. It only needs a dynamic leader 
who can motivate people and a lot of money. The motivation takes a lot of different forms, from health and wealth, to a more positive attitude, to physical healing, to stronger marriages. The list is endless. They're all motivated by the accumulation of wealth. All of the popular churches are wealthy churches. The average millennial isn't going to attend a poor church. Listen to what they brag about. The significant churches today are big, they're wealthy, they're influential. The church that shook the world in the first 300 years was small, fragmented, threatened, didn't have a penny between them. This new church is focused more on the earthly indicators of success, ignoring the fundamental principles of godliness and spiritual power. And as such, it is more worldly, more wealthy, more influ influential. And what it isn't is more godly.